Hey traders, welcome back to the channel. First of all, happy new year. I hope your year is off to a great start. Uh, before I took some time off for the holiday period, the TradingView developers released a sneaky update here to the PineScript language, which is what I wanna to cover today in this year's first video. I've already recorded this lesson. I recorded a half hour lesson on this, and then I just realized that my microphone wasn't recording for some reason. And so that's a great start to the year for me. Um, so let's do take two. So what is the new feature that TradingView have added to PineScript? It is user-defined types. So what is a user-defined type? Well, experienced programmers can think of these as methodless classes. So if you've ever worked with other programming languages, you'll be familiar with what a class is. It's basically a object that contains functions and variables usually. Well, this type, this PineScript user-defined type does not contain functions. It only contains variables or fields. So now instead of using independent variables like pivot time and pivot level to track pivot data, you can define a pivot type with two fields to hold all of those values. So in today's example, we're just going to demonstrate how to use this new feature. It's not a super practical example. I couldn't really think of one, to be honest, to um, show you guys. Uh, but basically all this does, it's just a quality of life feature update, particularly to help keep more complex scripts better organized and more efficient. And so what this user-defined type does is it just holds a bunch of data types values, variables, grouped under a user-defined type value. So before we jump into the Pine editor to break down this new feature, let's look at the official documentation. So before we start, I should note here that this is advanced material. So if you're a beginner to PineScript, this video is probably not for you. And uh, if you are a beginner to PineScript, make sure to go and check out my free PineScript basics course. It will help jumpstart you on your path to mastering PineScript. It's completely free. It's a couple of hours of content in that course. And I also have tons of content on this YouTube channel. Just check out the PineScript Mastery playlist. If you go through the majority of those lessons, um, by the time you're done with that, you should be able to wrap your head around what we're doing here. But for those of you who are not new to PineScript and are experienced, let's jump into the documentation here. So PineScript user-defined objects are the equivalent of variables containing parts called fields. And each field is able to hold independent values that can be of various data types. So here's an example of creating a user-defined type. Here we create a pivot point type that contains a bar index or timestamp, a price value, and the xlock value. So we'll explain what this all means in a moment. But first, let me find a more simple example here. Uh, so this is just defining a simple user-defined type called bar info. And this bar info type holds a bar index, a bar timestamp, and a bar's closing price value. And the VAR and VAR IP keywords apply to all of the objects fields. So let's copy this code, jump into the Pine editor and break down what we're doing. So here's our code. I'll add it to the chart and break down what's happening here. So we've got two plots here, two lines plotting onto our chart. The first one is plotting first bar's index value, this value here. And the second one is plotting the current bar's index value. So let's add another plot on here. Let's add in uh, current bar will be more interesting. Let's do current bar dot C. Now this plot will be plotting the closing price. I'll change the color to color.green, save our code. And now we'll have a third line drawing here. This green value is the current bar's closing price. And we're retrieving that closing price from our user-defined type. So this line of code here is declaring a persistent data type. And this data type is a bar info data type. And this first bar variable is assigned to bar info dot new. Now, because we are defining the default values for each field in this type, we don't need to pass anything into this new function in order to create this type. This first bar will contain the bar index, the timestamp and the closing price of whichever bar this is called on. And so in this case, because this is a persistent variable, it's only created once and then it does not update on every new bar on our chart. If we want to change any values in this, we need to override them. So what's happening here, if I go to the very first bar on our chart, if I change this to first bar dot C, save my code. It's annoying that this pops up now every time you save your script, that annoys me, but anyway, whatever, it's the worst things in the world. So what's happening here is we're declaring first bar. We're assigning first bar to a new bar info type. And this new bar info type is being populated with these values here. So when I hover my mouse over all these bars on my chart, the first plot is going to remain zero because that's the first bar index on our chart. We start counting bar indexes from zero. And the green number is going to be the closing price of that very first bar on our chart. Now, if I wanted to change first bars values for whatever reason, 
there's two ways I can do this. Uh, the first way, um, let me get rid of these plots first of all and change this to first bar dot T. So now we're plotting all three values from our first bar data type. And the second value is a timestamp. That's why that number is massive. So now what we could do is we could override these values if we wanted to. So I could say first bar dot I is assigned 33, for example. Let's assign all the values to 33. Save my code. And now all these numbers will say 33. So that's how you can override a, a custom user defined types of values. That's one way you can do it. The other way is when you're creating it. So instead of allowing this bar info data type to populate its fields with the default values here, we can override them by specifying them in the uh, parameters when creating this object. So now when I save my code, these numbers will all say 33 as well. And if I wanted to only override one of these values, let's say we want to override the time for whatever reason, I can say t equals 33. Well, let's make it 44, Lewis Hamilton. And uh, there you go. So the first value is still our bar index. The second value is now 44. And the third value is still the closing price. So that's how we deal with user-defined types. It's pretty simple. The main advantage of using these would be in more complex scripts. Uh, it can help make your script more readable for one thing. And in some cases it can make your script or your code more efficient. For example, the documentation says you can um, use these bar types to request data from the security function. So instead of having like 10 values, like say we wanted to get the uh, ATR value and we wanted to get the RSI value and we wanted to get the uh, volume value and the high value, um, instead of having these three, uh, these four different parameters and requesting them from the security function, we could just declare a type here and we could have um, indicator values equals um, float ATR value, float RSI value, float volume value, and float high value. And what we could do is we could create a new variable here called bar TA for bar technical analysis. And this could be set to indicator values dot new. And then we could pass in the ATR over the past 14 bars, the RSI over the past 14 bars, the current bars volume and the current bars high. And now we have all of these values contained within a single type. And if we wanted to plot or, or analyze any one of these values, we could just simply pass in bar TA dot RSI value. And there we go. We are plotting the RSI value and we're getting that value from our user-defined type. And so you can see how this can just tidy up and better organize complex scripts. With simple scripts, you're probably never gonna have any reason to use these, but in more complex scripts, they can uh, be quite useful. So let's cover a more complex example of using this new feature. So there's a few examples in the documentation here. Let's copy the code from this one first. So here we're using user-defined types to track pivot points. So each label on my chart here is a pivot high, and I'll explain how we're tracking this data using this new user-defined type. So first of all, when you're detecting pivots using the inbuilt pivot function, you need to tell PineScript how many bars to look left and how many bars to look right to detect that swing high. So this pivot here is not detected until 10 bars after the fact. So legs input is how many legs, how many bars look left and right. The next thing we do is we define our custom type. This custom type has three fields or three values, three parameters within it. Uh, the first is an integer type, the second a float, the third a string. The first value is a either a bar index or a bar timestamp. The second value is a price value and the third value is an xlock value. I'm not sure what xlock stands for. I always think of it as x location, but I could be wrong about that, but it's not really important. The next thing we do here is we detect any pivot high points. So the ta.pivot high will detect any swing highs that occur over a 10 bar look back to the left and a 10 bar look back. Technically it's a look back, but think of it as a look forward from the pivot. 10 bars to the right as well. So 10 bars after this swing high, the script will loop back 10 bars and loop forward 10 bars from this bar here. And if it is the swing high, the highest value over those 10 bars, it's assigned to this value here. The, the high price is assigned 
to pivot high price. If a pivot high is not detected, so as you can see this impulsive move down here, there is no swing highs that occur where the bar is the highest bar, 10 bars left and right. So pivot high price during this sort of price action will be set to NA or null. And so what we can do is we can use an if statement here to check. If pivot high price is not NA, that means we have a legitimate pivot price value detected and this code here gets executed. And what we do in this code here is we check if a new pivot high was found, display a label where it occurred. So first of all, we use our custom user defined type to store these values. So we use pivot point dot new to define a new pivot point and we pass in the timestamp of the pivot high. So remember that needs to be 10 bars back. So we pass in our legs input into the historical operator here. So we get the timestamp from the pivot point 10 bars back. And then we also pass in the high price of that bar. And now we can use found point to tell the label where to draw itself and what text to put on the label. So first of all, if I bring up the documentation for the label, the arguments this label function takes is an X parameter. So that's a bar index or a timestamp. The Y value is the price of the label position. And then we need to give it some text and there's some other optional parameters here. We also need to tell it what our X value is. Is it a bar index or is it a bar timestamp? So by default, our pivot point type tells this label that we want X lock to be a timestamp. We could override this if we wanted to, as I showed you in the previous example, we could change this to X lock dot bar index. And now X lock is going to specify X as a bar index, but we'll leave the default parameter here as bar time. And so for our label, we're passing in the bars timestamp stored within our custom object here, our found point object. We're passing in the Y value, which is the pivot high price. We're converting that pivot high into a string and rounding off the decimal places to the minimum decimal place here. That's what min tick is, it's the minimum tick value. That shaves off any excess decimal places after the decimal. And then we tell this label that we want our X lock value to be a bar timestamp and we pass in our text color. Now, in this particular example, this is just showing you how to use user-defined types. If you were doing something like this, you probably wouldn't use a user-defined type. It's just unnecessary. We could achieve exactly the same thing by getting rid of all this, changing this to this and this to this, get rid of that and change this to xlock.bar time. Now this will achieve exactly the same thing. Whoops, I've got an excess comma there. This will achieve exactly the same thing, but with less lines of code. But as you can see, it is slightly less readable. So the main advantage of using these user-defined types is one, to make your scripts more readable when dealing with lots of parameters that can get a bit confusing to the eye, or to make your script more efficient when dealing with a lot of parameters in a more complex script. But for the most part, you're not going to be using user-defined types very often. But the beauty of PineScript is it allows you to do these sorts of things if you need to. You can make your scripts as complex and sophisticated as you want, or as simple and stripped back as you want. There's many different ways to achieve things in PineScript. This just gives us another way of organizing our variables. And so before I wrap up this lesson, let's look at a slightly more complex application of this new user-defined type. So back on the documentation here, I'm gonna scroll down to this example here where we're doing exactly the same thing. We're detecting pivot highs, but we're also drawing a line between them. So I'm gonna copy all of this code here and we'll break down what's happening. Here we go, save the script. We'll be getting exactly the same thing, but now we have a line drawing connecting our pivots. So same look back period, 10 bars left and right. Now our pivot point type is changed a little bit here. This version of the pivot point type does not explicitly define what our X lock is uh, because we are just going to hard code our script to treat X lock as a bar timestamp. And we don't need to store that in the pivot point, but we still need the um, bar timestamp of our pivot. So that's the opening time of the pivot bar and the price level. So this could also be called price, but I'll leave it as level for now. So in this example, uh, the documentation is demonstrating how to use user defined types in an array. So what we're doing here is we're creating an empty pivot point array. So we're creating an array with the data type pivot point. And then what we're doing, just like the previous example, we are detecting pivot highs over our look back period of 10 bars left and right. 
And if a pivot high is detected, then we create a new pivot point data type. So pivot point dot new creates a new pivot point type. We pass in the bar time of that pivot. So remember this gets to detected 10 bars after the fact. So we need to pass in our historical operator here and our look back value. So we're getting the timestamp 10 bars back once that pivot is confirmed. And we're also passing in the high price of that pivot. Once we've created our new pivot data type, we push that or insert that into our array. So the array.push function takes an array ID. Then once we have that new pivot data type, we push or insert that into our array using the array.push function. We need to pass in an array ID. So we're passing in our pivot array and we're inserting or pushing our new pivot object into that array. And so we're collecting and storing these pivot points as they occur. And then here on the very last confirmed bar on our chart, so the last closed bar, if we are on that bar, then this code gets executed. And what this code is doing is we're declaring a persistent variable. It's a pivot point data type, our custom pivot point data type. And this stores the previous pivot point so that we can draw a line from there to the current pivot point. And how we do that is we loop through our array. So this is what is called a for each loop. So there's two different types of for loops in Python in most languages. So for example, we could make a counter. So for i equals zero to 10 would loop from zero to 10. And whatever code is in here uh, can reference that loop counter. Another option for looping is the for each loop. So what this for loop does is it says for each value of x within our array, do something with x. So in this case, x is a pivot point data type. And so for each loop in this for loop, we can reference uh, each pivot. So this will start from the first object in our array and loop all the way to the last object in our array. And so this code here is creating, first it's creating a label and then drawing a line between those two points. So to display the label, we're creating a new label. We pass in our bars open type for each value in our array, each object in our array. So this will draw a label at the pivots open time, bar timestamp and the pivots price value. We're passing in the price value as a string. We're telling PineScript that we want our X value to be a timestamp and not a bar index. In most cases, you can use bar indexes and bar time stamps interchangeably. But for this example, we're using bar time and we're specifying the text color to be white. Now for our Y value, if you wanted to um, make this label draw a bit higher, right now it's drawing right on that high value. But if you wanted to raise this by let's say 100 points or 10 pips in Forex, uh, we could add in a addition here. We can add sim info dot minimum tick multiplied by 100 that would raise our label by 100 points. So if I save my code, the label jumps up by 100 points or in Forex, that would be one pip. Uh, but anyway, the next thing we do is we check if our previous pivot point is not NA. So when our very first pivot point is detected, this will be NA because we don't have a previous pivot point. And so if that is not the case, that means we have more than one pivot point. So if previous pivot point is not NA, then we want to create a new line and this line is drawing from the previous pivot points open time. So using this as an example, the line starts on this bar's timestamp and it starts from this bar's swing high price and it draws to the current pivot points bar timestamp and the current pivot points swing high. And again, just like the label, we need to specify what our X value is. In this case, our X value is not a bar index, but a timestamp. And then notice that this is not within the scope of our if statement here. It's not indented or tabbed. And so on each for loop, we assign previous point to the current object in our loop from our array. And so as we loop through all of the pivots that we've detected on our chart, we connect the line from the previous pivot to the current pivot over and over and over again. That's how we get this joining line. Anyway, that will about do it for today's lesson. As I mentioned, this is not a particularly practical example of how to use user-defined types because we can achieve this exact same thing uh, with less lines of code by simply referencing our pivot high price and the time value explicitly without needing to store them within a custom data type. But this is just a simple example of how to use 
data types, user-defined data types. Um, obviously, if you've got a complex script, it would make more sense to use this new feature. Or if you've got a script where the variables you're working with, the values you're working with are sort of hard for you to interpret very quickly at a glance. So if you're dealing with like 10 different values that all have parameter names that are not super intuitive to the eye, you can group them all under a user data type that might make it a little bit easier to read your script when um, dealing with complex code. That would be the main reason I would use something like this personally, would be to better organize a complex script so that I can read it easier. Other than that, there's not really any major advantage to using these user-defined data types. As I said at the beginning of the video, this is just a quality of life update to make coding, in some cases, more efficient, but mostly just easy to read. It does say in the documentation that you can use these custom data types to request data from the security function. That could be quite useful. For example, if you wanted to get the uh, higher time frame, let's say the daily chart, we wanted to get the daily charts, RSI value, ATR value, um, ADX value, and the uh, MACD value. <laughs> let's say we wanted to get like 10 different indicator values from the security function. We could define all of those values within a user-defined data type and then pass that data type into the security function to request all of those values. And then we could reference those values as I showed you at the start of this lesson. We could reference all of those values in a more intuitive way. Instead of having all of those values written out individually as variables, we could just have one data type that stores all of those different values. That would be a good example of when you might want to use user-defined data types. However, I haven't quite figured out how to use the user-defined data types to pass into the security function yet. So perhaps in a future lesson, when we're dealing with the security function, I'll include an example of how to do that then. But for now, I'm going to wrap this video up here. If you have a creative reason why uh, you personally would want to use these data types in your scripts, please let me know in the comments section. I would love to know your thoughts on how best to apply this new feature. Personally, I can't really think of many ways I would use it, but I'm sure some of you out there will have some great suggestions. With that said, I will speak with you in the next video. Take care, best of luck with your trading, and I hope 2023 is your best year yet.